Worshippers, it's good for us to be together again and refocus on our relationship with God and refresh our faith. I'm Pastor Kurt Lemko coming to you on behalf of Christ Lutheran Church in Rochester. And today we're thinking about the various ways in which Jesus is viewed by various people. We take a closer look at what the Bible has to say about him in various situations. With that then, we're ready to move toward worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 85. Renew our faith, O God. Forgive us our many failures and infidelities. May our land continue to be a place where we can be free to love and serve you. O God, you have indeed been good to us. You have prospered our land. You have opened your heart to us in love. You have forgiven our sins and adopted us. But now our country is in turmoil. We no longer have confidence in our leaders. Our citizens are in revolt. People are turning away from you and are being ensnared by strange doctrines and godless philosophies. We know that you have not turned away from us. You touch with joy and peace the hearts that are open to you. You stand ready to show your salvation. Renew our faith, O God. Forgive us our many failures and infidelities. May our land continue to be a place where we can be free to love and serve you. We continue with the Old Testament lesson from Amos chapter 7, beginning at the 7th verse. Here God is using his prophet to tell the nation that they will be punished for their infidelity toward him. We read, This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at the third verse. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him 
who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who are the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is from Mark chapter 6, beginning at the 14th verse. King Herod was uh, in trouble, I guess, with John, who condemned him for marrying his brother's wife. And so he wanted to get rid of him, but still he kind of feared him. And so that conflict was ongoing as we come to this reading. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, He is Elijah. And still others claimed, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with the orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. We respond with our statement of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today we're thinking about Matthew 11 where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then Mark 6, part of the gospel from last week, he began to send them out 
two by two. So we have those two things beside each other and they seem to be contradictory almost. Come to me and go out. But we see as we take a closer look that they kind of fit together. We start with Jesus. How do we see Jesus? Will a closer look give us a deeper insight and a more complete insight as to who he is? First of all, at his birth, there was an indication that this was something special. You'll see throughout scriptures that when there is something really special happening, angels are often used as messengers to tell of the event. And of course, the angels came at the birth of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to men, they said. But then after that, it seems that Jesus lived a pretty normal life. As a baby, well, he was a normal child. I remember talking to some three and four year olds once about Jesus when he was a baby. <clears throat> and I asked them, do you think the baby Jesus cried? Hmm, they weren't so sure. Some thought probably he did cry sometimes. I said, well, I don't think he did that. And then I asked the question, do you think the baby Jesus wet his diaper? Oh no, they were all assured that he did wet his diaper. And so we have that expectation of something special about the baby Jesus. He would do things or not do things which are different from other people, but really his life was pretty normal. He was the oldest and he was probably around his father's carpenter shop. Joseph was a carpenter. He probably did ox yokes and furniture for people's houses. And uh, you can imagine Jesus as he started growing up, he'd play with the shavings and uh, later on he would maybe gather some wood and bring it to Joseph as he needed it. And then finally he'd be using the tools. Christian tradition says that Joseph died as the kids were not very old. And so this made Joseph as the oldest son, kind of the man of the household. And he probably took over the business and made enough money to feed the family and uh, trained the younger children to do the work so that when he was gone, their mother would be taken care of. Anyway, this uh, Jesus was, uh, he's a productive guy, but even Jesus, maybe inadvertently or not on purpose, disappointed his parents. You probably remember the story about Jesus when he was 12 years old going up to Jerusalem with his parents for the Passover. And uh, when it was over, people started going home and Mary and Joseph assumed that Jesus was going with his cousins and uh, traveling along and he was on the way home with the rest of them. But at the end of the day, they couldn't find him. And so they went back to Jerusalem. They looked for him for three days. Finally, they found him in the temple discussing theology with the teachers there who were amazed at his answers. And his parents said, why did you do this to us? And he was surprised, he said, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And so we see at the age of 12 that Jesus was already beginning to understand that he had a special mission from God the Father. But then it says, Luke 2, he went home and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He was a good kid. In fact, some people have suggested maybe he'd be the one that people would point to and say, why can't you be more like your cousin Jesus? He's a good guy. But uh, that's speculation. But it does say he grew in favor with God and man. And then later on, of course, as Jesus grew up, we don't hear much from that point until John, his cousin, started saying, this is the one you're waiting for. He pointed to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
And that connects him with that Old Testament practice of laying the hands of the priest on an animal and sending him out into the wilderness to die, with the implication that the sins of Israel also died with that animal. In the case of Jesus, he literally did carry those sins to the cross and died with them. And so this designation by John connects him with that Old Testament practice. Now in this reading for today, we have a little bit of a, well, a mini picture, I guess, of what happens to Christians sometimes, the followers of Jesus. John told the truth and he paid the price. As we heard, the daughter of Herodias danced and pleased the king and he said, I'll give you anything you want. And she, of course, said, I want the head of John the Baptist on the plate. Many expected Jesus to act a certain way. But you know, it seems that he always had something more to say. There was a closer look that would give us a new insight into Jesus. His enemies were always trying to trap him in, in his words, and they would take those things which the people would expect and challenge him with them. And one of the key things there was the Roman occupation of the area. And so everybody hated the Romans, and they had to pay taxes to them. And so they said, well, We'll take some of Herod's people and we'll go out and we'll put him on the spot. And we'll say, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And of course, they thought if he said yes, all the people would be against him because they all hated the Romans. If he said no, then he'd be in trouble with the authorities right away. So what did he do? He didn't do what they expected. There wasn't one way or the other. It was both. He said, whose picture is on the coin and whose insignia is there? And they said, Caesar's. He said, therefore, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. And it says, they went away amazed at what he said to them. He had a way of taking a closer look at things and coming down to the reality of things without even seemingly trying. It was, it was just there for him. In his hometown, it was a different expectation. They didn't see him as a prophet. Last week we read that Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town. And so he was doing all these things and they were saying, how can he do this? Where did he get this wisdom? Isn't this Jesus and aren't his brothers and sisters living among us now? And they couldn't understand how he could be the one that was doing all these things that seemingly were impossible to do with his miracles and so forth. So, again, he surprised people. He did things that uh, they weren't expecting. When it comes to religious leaders, there were always conflicts. There was once when Jesus and his disciples were walking through the grain fields and the disciples were hungry. And so they just picked some heads of grain and started eating them. And they said, aha, he's working on the Sabbath. This is not allowed. And they challenged Jesus. And Jesus said, don't you remember the priests in the Old Testament when their people were hungry and they took the showbread from the temple and ate it and they did not sin? Oh, yeah. And in the same vein, there was the healing on the Sabbath day. They said, is it proper to heal on the Sabbath? Because this also was work, and there was to be no work done on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, let's suppose that you had a sheep, and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath day. Wouldn't you stop everything and pull that animal out? 
They had to admit, yes, they would do that. And Jesus said, isn't a person a lot more valuable than a sheep? Therefore, it is proper to do good on the Sabbath. And the Son of Man, referring to himself, is also Lord of the Sabbath. And so, there are also other stories in the Old Testament that connect. Jesus is talking about um, one point where he said the only sign you'll get is the sign of Joni. Remember, we talked about signs a few weeks ago. Those actions or words which point beyond themselves to a deeper meaning. And he said, the only sign you will get is the sign of Jonah. And he was talking about Jonah being in the belly of a whale, and he would be in the belly of the earth, so to speak, before his resurrection. And the resurrection would be the sign. And also the bronze serpent. There was a time when the people of Israel, as they were traveling from slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land, they were complaining about something, and God let serpents come among them. And if they would bite someone, they would die. And of course, they came to Moses and said, pray for us. And God told Moses, make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And anyone who comes and looks at the serpent, even if he has been bitten by a snake, will live. And that happened. And Jesus it was indicated he had to be lifted up as well. But this was a deeper kind of looking. It was not just seeing physically, but seeing spiritually and recognizing Jesus as Savior. And it wasn't just physical life that would be given, but life with God and life with God forever. So that kind of leads to us as we take a closer look what do we see? Well, we all probably have our own way of thinking about Jesus. Most of the time it's the Jesus of forgiveness and love and forgiveness. But he also is the God who asks us to be his agents. That's why he says, come to me and I will give you rest. But he also says, go. In our gospel for today, it looks back to the time when he was training his disciples and then he sent them out two by two. That says a couple of things. First of all, the two by two indicates that we need some support. We need other people to go with us on this journey of faith. And it also means that we have a mission. We have things to do. And we have to sometimes look and be trained and try out some things. There was a man who said he had a person in his congregation who was so shy he wouldn't even look at anybody. And he recognized him as a person with some ability, so he wanted him to somehow get into a leadership position. And so he said what I did was uh, ask him to help with taking the offering during the church service, which he did. And then little by little, he worked him up until at that point, when he was telling the story, the man was a worship leader. He was leading the songs for the congregation. And so sometimes it takes us a long time to find our particular little piece of the action so that we can do what we can in order to build the kingdom, carry out the mission, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we keep trying things, we listen to other people, participate in the Christian community. We look at Jesus with a closer look as we see him in the pages of scripture. And then we go, we do what we can. And we move forward as the people of God, doing the work of God. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond all our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God of mystery, power, and love, help us to see that your Son can act in ways which seem contradictory, 
Yet, with a closer look, we see that his actions are appropriate for the situation. Keep us from falling into the trap of thinking that you and your son are simple, acting in only one way, and not complex with thoughts and insights which are beyond our ability to understand. We sing, beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, and we think of holy Jesus, meek and mild, and yet this is the same one who took a whip and drove the cheating sellers of sacrificial animals from the temple area. We remember how Jesus forgave and encouraged others, yet could say, Woe to you hypocrites! Jesus was many things to many people. For us, he gives the promise of rest for our souls, and at the same time asks us to find ways to advance the kingdom of God. Help us to perceive your purpose in our lives and to respond in appropriate ways. In all things, let our understanding and our relationship with you continue to grow as we all move forward toward the final fulfillment of your plans. We pray in the name of Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.